Have you ever seen HDR done badly? I know I have, and it looks awful. But when it's done right, HDR can look like just a really well-exposed photograph, to the point where you could be forgiven for not even thinking it was HDR. Well, Darktable has all the tools built in for you to do high dynamic range images. Let's find out how we do it. If you're like me, you've probably had an experiment with HDR images at some point in your photographic journey. I know I've produced some awful looking crap and I'm trying to get better at it. And thankfully Darktable has all the tools built in for us to do that. Now, if you've not shot HDR before, it's pretty easy as long as you've got a tripod and a camera that can shoot RAW because Darktable will only generate HDR files from RAW files. It will not use JPEGs as source images. And the reason for that is that JPEG is an 8-bit format, right? which means that it can only store 256 shades of grey if we include pure black and pure white as shades of grey. Right? So essentially there's pure black, pure white, and 254 shades of grey in between. And that's just not enough data to work with. Now, you could argue that if you shot enough bracketed exposures, even in JPEG, then you would end up with enough data to do something. But Darktable, for whatever reason, will only use RAW files as source images for HDR. So, what I've got here is three different images that I've shot exposure bracketed sets. Uh, at different times and places of the world. And what we will do to create an HDR file is click on the first image, hold down shift, click on the last image. That will select the entire set of images that we are going to use for our HDR set. We go to the selected images module and we click on create HDR. And as we can read from the tooltip, creates a high dynamic range image from the selected shots. Now, what Darktable is doing there is taking each RAW file, and in this particular instance, these were shot on my A850, which shot 12-bit RAW files. It's taking all of that data and it's putting it into a DNG format as a 32-bit image. And what that means is that there is a massive latitude of exposure information for Darktable to then work with. Now, what I'm looking at right here is a collection of images that I've tagged with EP030, because this is episode 30. And you will notice that what happened when I created that HDR, that HDR has not shown up here. And that's to be expected. So what I would need to do is look at one of these images, find out where it is. It's 2015, 9th of July. So I'm going to need to go to that folder. And thankfully, I did that just a moment ago. So I can click on this recently used collection. And there is the DNG. We can see DNG on the thumbnail. So if I now, I'm just going to add that tag to that image. So now I can go back to this collection. So I've got this DNG file and it looks super dark. What's the point of that? Well, that's just the starting point. What's really interesting here is just how much I can crank the exposure on this DNG file because it's 32 bits of data. There is so much exposure information here that we can just go nuts. So we'll go plus three stops and then we'll add another instance and we'll add another three stops of exposure. And look at that. Like we've still got all of this amazing information inside this 32 bit file. But that's not how we process HDR. So we'll come back here. Actually, I'll just go back there in the history stack. So this is our starting point. Now, there are multiple ways that we can process HDR. There are two specific modules within Darktable that are designed 
for working with HDR images. They appear in the tone group and one of them is global tone map and the other one is tone mapping. Now the tone mapping module was the original default module for processing HDR images in Darktable and the manual says the underlying algorithm uses a bilateral filter to decompose an image into a coarse base layer and a detail layer. The contrast of the base layer is compressed while the detail layer is preserved and then both layers are recombined. So if we look at the two controls that we've got here, we've got contrast compression, so that will work with the amount of exposure information that is buried within this 32-bit DNG file and the spatial extent will work on the detail that's within the image. So if we just turn this module on, straight away we can see that it's tried to bring up all of this dark detail that was inside this cave in Borneo and retain all of the highlight information from this area that was outside the cave in direct sunlight. But we've kind of got this sort of smoky haloing effect where there's the transition between the two areas of exposure. So we can try different amounts of contrast compression. We could bring this down, which looks a little bit more realistic because you expect the inside of the cave to be dark. And we've still got the information of the detail in the rocks out there in the bright sunlight. And we could tweak that to whatever we thought was going to work best and we could muck around with the spatial extent which tends to apply a bit of a soft blur to the detail. Overall I'm not blown away with this particular module. So let's throw it out the window. We'll go back to the base curve in our history stack and we'll have a look at the global tone map module. Now this is obviously a newer module and I say that because in the help file it says global tone mapping processes each pixel of an HDR image without taking into account the surrounding information. This is generally faster than the local tone mapping of the tone mapping module, but might lead to less convincing results with very high dynamic range scenes. As an enhancement to the original operators, Darktable can preserve detail of the input image and transfer it back to the output image. Now, there are three what are known as operators, and we can see that from this first drop down. There's Reinhard, Filmic, and Drago. Now, I don't think Filmic has any relationship to the new module that appeared in Darktable 2.6 called Filmic. I think they're something different, but I don't know for sure. We'll see that the third option there, Drago, is the one that this module defaults to, and you'll soon see why. If I was to... Just make sure we're on the base curve in our history stack. If we were to activate this module in the Reinhard mode, in the, that operator, all we've got is a single slider called detail. And as we drag it to the left, the image gets very blurry. And as we drag it to the right, it gets less blurry. But it doesn't actually open up the detail in the shadows at all. So that's not much use to us. Let's try Filmic. Filmic does something. It certainly seems to lose a lot of the color information, but it does tend to bring some of the light out of the shadows. So what I'm thinking with both of these is that perhaps we should have applied some exposure adjustment before we started. So let's just jump back to base curve. Let's go to the exposure module. Let's give it three stops just as a starting point. Now let's try global tone map and the Reinhard algorithm. And yep, 
as we can see, as we drag that detail slider to the left, everything gets a soft focus kind of look. As we drag it to the right, everything gets sharper. Mm, it's okay. It's not brilliant, but you know, there's certainly less of that smoky, shady highlight thing happening around the transition between the shadow areas and the bright sunlit areas. So that's certainly an improvement over the tone mapping module. Let's try the filmic algorithm. Wow. Okay, so that's done a really good job of opening up the shadows. It's lost a little bit of the detail in the bright sunlit areas, but we've really lost a lot of the saturation from the image. So I guess we could then come over to contrast brightness and saturation and wow, mm, yeah, it's doing stupid things to the area out there in bright sunlight, but not really bringing back the saturation of the detail inside the cave. So that's really not a valid approach either. So let's have a look at the Drago algorithm. Just going to hit reset. And so that's Drago in its default mode. The manual tells us that the person who wrote the Drago algorithm recommends that bias should start at 0.85, that that's a good starting point. Uh, you can muck around with different biases if you like, and as you can see, that as you come to the left, it lightens it up. If you go higher up, it's going to make things a little bit darker. But 0.85 seemed like a reasonable place to start. The target slider, according to the manual, is only offered for the Drogo operator. This is a scale factor to adjust the global image brightness to the brightness of the intended display. In other words, you would only muck around with this slider if you knew something about the display mechanism on which this image was going to be viewed. This is a scale factor to adjust the global image brightness to the brightness of the intended display. It is measured in candelas per square meter, which is the standard uh, method of measuring luminosity, and should match the according value of your output device. Higher values lead to a brighter image, while lower values lead to a darker image. As we can see, as we move it to the right, things get brighter. If we move it to the left, things get darker. Again, I'm seeing that trade-off in saturation, though. So the further to the right we push it, yes, we do get a little bit more of the detail in the shadow, although at the expense of detail out there in the sunlight. But we are also sacrificing saturation as well. Not sure what I'm thinking about any of this at this point in time. Let's move on to one of the other sets of HDR source images that I've got, and we'll try another method. Okay, I was going to use this sequence of images here on the second row, but I realized that when I produced the DNG file, I didn't actually shoot that on a tripod, it was handheld, and the images aren't perfectly aligned, so I'm just going to skip over those. This last set of images was shot in one of the sea caves at Portimao on the south coast of Portugal. And here's the DNG file of that sequence of eight images. So we'll double click on this. And as you can see, all I've done is applied a rotate to uh, straighten the horizon on this image. And what I've found and I, I've got to say, I'm just loving the Filmic module. And what I've found is that the Filmic module just does a much better job than either of the tone mapping modules in working with an HDR image. So what I have found through trial and error prior to sitting down to record this episode is I'll go in here, I'll boost that up three stops. And as we can see, we've got a pretty decent image there already. We'll go to the Filmic module and applying everything we learned in the Filmic video, we're going to bring the 
middle grey luminance up so that our histogram is evenly distributed across the center line. We'll then set our white point, set our black point. Already this is looking pretty phenomenal straight out of the box. Uh, we'll increase the latitude because I do want a bit of darkness in the inside of the cave here. Bring our balance up so that these two points are sitting inside that middle square and then just apply a little bit of contrast and what I'm seeing straight away is a really good interpretation of what was a very high dynamic range scene you know, I had really bright sun reflecting off the rock here on the left-hand side, really bright sun out there and the beach, you know, getting full sun on it and the sky, and there was quite deep shadow inside the cave here. I mean, if we go back and look at the source images, you can get an idea for just how much, you know, this was the darkest exposure you know, which I shot so that I'd get that nice rich blue sky and coming all the way up to here so that we could get all of the detail in the rock but all of the highlights are blown way out of the water. So when you consider all of that together, this is actually a pretty nice rendition of that HDR image and we haven't gone near the tone map or the global tone map module to do it. Now you might say, well, maybe this was just a better set of source images, that maybe there was something about the way I shot the cave scene in Borneo that maybe, you know, this was just better source images and it works better. Well, let's give that a try. We've got nothing to lose. So we'll go back to the light table. We'll go back to the DNG file from Borneo. We'll go back to our base curve. So we're right back at square one, essentially. We will throw in our three stops of exposure. I actually think we might go... Actually, yeah, we might go one more. And we'll just... We'll maybe go two stops. So we're now up five stops of exposure from the original DNG file. So we'll bring our middle grey luminance up. Ooh, yeah. I don't know how this is going to go. Maybe it is a case of the, the source images. Maybe there's just too much dynamic range in this, but we'll see how we go. Now that white point, wow, I've got to go all the way over to there to get that back into the histogram. And our black point, yep, fair enough. So we've now got good detail inside the cave, but it does look like we're losing what's outside in the bright sunlight but we will persevere i'm going to increase the latitude a little bit and you know, really don't need to move that any further so what i do notice from using the filmic module is that we don't seem to sacrifice the saturation like we seem to do with both the tone mapping and the global tone mapping modules. I'm not sure why saturation suffers under those two modules, but it certainly seems to. Obviously, if you use those modules, you can then go and, you know, crank the saturation back up with other modules after the fact. As for this one, maybe, maybe what I could do is apply a drawn oh, well actually I, just, I might just go drawn mask rather than drawn and parametric let's go to drawn mask and let's just draw a very rough mask around here and we want to invert that and then holding our shift modifier, by the way, in case you hadn't realized with Darktable 2.6, you now use your shift modifier to change the size of the feather on a drawn mask. Uh, I 
didn't realise that until this week and I had to ask the question and someone said, oh, there's been plenty of discussion on that, Bruce. You should have been aware of that. (laughs) Oops, sorry. (laughs) Uh, So, yes, hold the shift key whilst you roll your mouse wheel and that will allow you to alter the feather of a mask. Uh, It used to be that you would simply mouse over the line for the mask and use your mouse wheel by itself that behavior has changed because it was deemed to be not particularly intuitive for new users. So just be aware of that trap for young players. Now down at the bottom here, I'm just going to let that mask spread a little wider. That's better. All right. So how does that look? Has that helped at all? It has a little bit. Um, Maybe I would need to do a similar thing on the original exposure module as well and we will do drawn mask as well and we will go from this drop down use the same path as exposure one and again we want to invert that and no that's way too much so I'm going to use my control key to lessen the intensity of that mask and I can bring that back but I just don't think that's going to look believable Uh, obviously I've got way too much black here Uh, I should probably use drawn and parametric to fine tune that mask and in all honesty I think I've maybe turned down the luminosity of the outside area a little too much in relationship to the darkness of the inside of the cave. So that's probably something I'd need to spend a little more time finessing. So with all of that said, there's three different methods you can use to process your HDR images in Darktable. You've got the tone map module, which seems to be very crude and basic. You've then got the global tone map module with its three different operators of which Drago appears to be the most effective of the lot. But all of them seem to sacrifice saturation in the HDR image in the process of trying to tone map the extremes of luminosity into something that can be output into an 8-bit image. Filmic, on the other hand, for my liking, seems to do a better job. Certainly did with this uh, Sea Caves from Portimao image. You know, uh, originally I tried processing this with the tone map uh, modules, and what I found was that I ended up with some really nasty artifacts along these high contrast edges, you know, between the dark of the rock and the brightness of the sand. Um, To me, the filmic module just did a much better job of it all. So I've got to say, Aurelian Pierre, man, loving your work. The filmic module is awesome. So if I wanted to process this image further, I would probably come over to the color zones module and I might just darken the blues just to give the sky a little bit more of an impact. How far can I push that and make it look believable? Mm, yeah it's maybe somewhat better yeah that's a little bit better so obviously I could tweak this more but I think hopefully I've explained the basics of how to create an HDR and then how to process that HDR in Darktable and once you've got it so that it's sitting nicely within your histogram you can then output it as a JPEG which is an 8-bit format and You know, you've got something that doesn't look like those badly processed HDRs that we were seeing five years ago. All right, that will do it for this episode. Catch you in the next one.